Yes, Mercy, you can start now. Mercy, you can start. Okay, sir. First of all, a very good afternoon to all of you present here. We are in the fourth session of three days national webinar, Tribal Life of India, Insiders and Outsiders Perspective. I'm very happy to be part of uh, this particular seminar. I thank Professor P.C. Patnaik, Dr. Venkat, the department, all the friends and colleagues to give me this opportunity to moderate this particular session. So without wasting any more time, let's get into the session. We have uh, four paper presenters for the session. So the first paper will be presented by Babita and the title of the paper is Traditional Attire of Botia Community as a Challenge to the Binary Dressing, Code of Contemporary Patriarchal Societies. The second paper will be presented by Dr. Rashmita Tripathi and Dr. Preeti Nanda Roy titled Marriage System of Gone Tribe of Western Odisha, an overview. The third paper is titled Axis Mundi in the Creation Myths of Meghalaya, will be presented by Dr. Anju Majaz. And the fourth one, which is the final paper for the session, will be presented by Junmani Basumatri, titled Law of Inheritance Among the Bodo Women of, in India. So before getting into this particular session, I have few instructions for the paper presenters. First is about the time limit. You will be given 20 minutes to present the paper. When you're left with five minutes, that is uh, when it is 15 minutes past the paper presentation, I will remind you of the time. Uh, the second instruction is that, please, I would like to, uh, ask all the participants to please introduce yourself before you begin the paper. So now let's go to the first paper, which is by Babita. Can I have Babita here? Yeah, sure, am I audible? Yes, you are. Uh, please give me a minute uh, so that oh, I can share my sure. presentation. Is my presentation visible? Hello? Uh, just give me a second. Uh, it isn't visible for me. Is it visible for the others? Just a minute, just a minute. Let me share it again. Yeah. Babita, are you there? Just a minute, ma'am, please. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know, it's saying it's not uh, a valid document or something. Mm -mm. Do I have the option to share my screen? I, yes, you have Zoom? the option. Yes. You are now the co-host, so you probably yes. can do that. Just a minute then. Director Beckett, please help her, help Babita. Babita, you can share, Babita. You are co-host now, you can share. Yes, sir, I, I am co-host. I can see that, but I'm not able to share a PowerPoint presentation because I'm using my phone. I don't know. It is showing it is not a valid document or something. No, no, do one thing. You have to upload it in the Google Drive. Then you can share. You can upload in the your attachment. The... The Gmail, okay. Google Drive will be there, now. you upload that. Okay, sure. You upload it to Google Drive, then from there you can work that. Okay, sir, sure. Hello? 
I think I'll take one more minute and then I can start. So it seems like I'm not able to present. Uh, there is some issue with. Babita, do you have a laptop? Uh, sir, I'm not using my laptop. My laptop uh, it does not have Zoom app in it, actually. So. <laughs> okay, I can uh, go with uh, the images maybe that I use for my presentation. Present, I think without PPT also, you can use and you can present without problem, no problem. Okay, sir. You continue, no issue. Okay, just you explain, no problem. Yeah. Now it is visible. Okay. Am I also visible? Yes, it is visible. You continue now. You and uh -huh. right. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Babita. I'm an MPhil research scholar at University of Delhi and also teaching as an assistant professor at one of the colleges of Delhi University. Uh, firstly, I would uh, like to thank uh, Professor Patnayak for giving me this opportunity to present my views in front of all of you. Uh, in today's paper, um, I have I'll be talking about the Bhotia tribes of uh, the Bhotia tribe of Uttarakhand, their attire specifically, and uh, how it is it can be seen as uh, a very important contributing factors in uh, one of the very important contributing factors in challenging patriarchy. So uh, let me start uh, uh, my paper now. So the title of my paper is Traditional Attire of the Bhotia Community as a Challenge to the Binary Dressing Code of Contemporary Patriarchal Societies. I'll first read the abstract so as to give you an overview of what this paper is going to bring. The Bhotia community is one of the five major tribes of Uttarakhand, along with the hills of Kumau and Garhwal. The Bhotias are also related to several dispersed groups in Nepal and adjacent areas of um, India, including the Tib Tibetans and Sherpas. One of the major attraction of the socio-cultural identity of this tribal community is its traditional attire. For most modern societies, the concept of binary dressing or binary dress code is an essential means of differentiating the men and women. For example, in the Western countries, men are supposed to wear shirt and trouser or coat pant. Women usually wear blouse and skirts, which are considered feminine dresses. In most regions in India, men wear trousers and shirt or kurta pajama, and women wear suit salwar or saris and blouse. Masculine and feminine dress codes are strictly decided in most Indian communities. Men and women also differ in their attire in terms of the colors they choose. While vibrant and floral colors such as red, pink, yellow are colors associated with feminine dress code, dark and neutral colors are associated with men. This kind of differentiation in patriarchal society is a crucial performance for substantiating Simone uh, de Beauvoir's uh, often quoted statement, one is not born woman, but rather becomes one. So through this paper, I would like to focus on uh, the dress code followed by the Bhotia tribe of Uttarakhand, which makes it not only unique, but can also be seen as a challenge to the patriarchal concept of binary dress codes for men and women. The Bhotia men wear long gowns, usually white in color, and pajamas with a long, um, with a long white stole around their waist, as you can also uh, see in one of the pictures that I'll just share with you, uh, maybe in a, a while. Um, and uh, 
uh, women wear black angani, which is a short shirt with intricate long sleeves uh, and a long black gown. And they also wear a black skirt with a kamala, a piece of a uh, piece of headgear along with white scarf. Women and men both wear the white stole around their waist. Similarly, men and women both wear long malas, karas, and earrings. There is no concept of makeup for women in this tribe. This traditional attire has always been recognized as an element in defining their ethnic identity, but it has not been looked at as a challenge to the patriarchal concept of binary dress codes for men and women in patriarchal societies. The white tuning-like scarf around the head of both men and women, the white rope-like stole around their waist, uh, commonality of fabric for men and women, absence of concept of makeup for women in the traditional attire makes it an interesting study to challenge the patriarchal concept of binary dressing uh, dress, dress codes in other societies around the globe. So let me begin the paper by introducing uh, the Bhutia community to you. Uh, some of you might all, uh, already uh, must have heard about the Bhutia community of Uttarakhand, but uh, I'll still give a brief uh, um, introduction of the Bhutia community, the Bhutia tribe of Uttarakhand. The Bhutia tribe is one of the five major tribes of Uttarakhand. This is a nomad tribe also found in other states such as Himachal, Sikkim, and Kashmir. They are known as Bhut in Kinnor region of Himachal Pradesh and Bhuta in Ladakh region of Kashmir. They are known as, um, apart from the Indian state, neighboring uh, regions such as Nepal and Tibet also has a significant population of the Bhutia tribe. This tribe would indulge on the route from India to Tibet, but after the 1960s uh, Indo-China political conflicts, uh, they, they are facing restrictions uh, in their trade across the transnational boundaries. They have a rich body of folk culture. Their folk songs include genres such as Tubera, Baju, and Timli. Apart from this general information about the Bhotia tribal community, what sets apart the Bhotias of Uttarakhand uh, from the other tribes in the region is the hybridity in their social, cultural, and religious beliefs. They are part Hindu, part Buddhist. Uh, in their religion, in terms of their religion. They are Mongoloid, but have been inhabiting the Himalayan regions of the state of Uttarakhand for a significantly long period of time. Many of the Bhotia communities, Bhotia tribes, follow mm -hmm. Buddhism, follow Buddhism uh, while a significant population follows Hinduism. They call, them de call themselves descendants of the Khas Rajput. They speak a mixture of Kumauni, Tibet, and Nepali. Dress code is uh, indeed a very important factor in every society in constructing gender. The binary dress code can be seen in almost all societies in the Western nations or the Asian countries like India. Women are supposed to embrace their femininity, uh, femininity through, while men are supposed to look masculine through their dress codes, through their dress. This binary in the dress code is quite visible through the other sartorial concepts such as wheeling in different forms by women. Uh, just a moment. I could not share the presentation, but I would like to support my uh, presentation through some pictures, if possible. As you can see, the dress, the length of the dress, the color of the dress, you know, all these are uh, a means of deciding which dress is meant of uh, what what gender uh, which gender is supposed to wear what kind of dress so these are means of constructing your gender <clears throat> while men choose more dark colors such as black gray or something like absolute white women wear more lively floral colors such as red yellow green and pink men choose fabric as per their comfort uh, uh, usually according to the climate, the season, while uh, women are usually, uh, you know, they are supposed to prefer fabrics such as silk, uh, georgette, etc., which are more, um, more important from the sense of fashion, or uh, which are luxurious, which is mostly a luxurious uh, fabric, which makes, uh, which, which looks quite feminine. Um, men wear solid footwear, uh, like or the shoes, etc. While women wear uh, delicate, uncomfortable sandals, jutis, etc. So the point of this kind of uh, an emphasis on the dress code 
uh, the feminine and the uh, masculine dress code is is to make you think about Simone de Beauvoir's uh, The Second Sex, where she shows a deeper understanding of how dress code in a society is one of the subtle yet quintessential means of constructing gender in any community. Her often quoted idea that one is not born a woman, but rather becomes one can help us to understand the importance of binary dress code in the construction of gender. Be it in the individual communities or formal organization, dress codes are often used to straight, straight jacket individuals into gender roles. Beauvoir emphasizes on the role of different choices we make to differentiate us from the other sex and how the different norms imposed on us through the instrument of culture eventually decide and construct our gender. I, uh, I emphasize on the word construct our gender. This is not something which is given to us. It is an accepted norms consistently that we identify ourselves as a specific gender and decide our identity and inclination by practicing these gender norms. The traditional attire of Bhutia community of Uttarakhand transgresses this binary in dress code for men and women in many aspects. This is despite the fact that they are a patriarchal community. Yes, what I found interesting uh, um, uh, in the research uh, when, when I was doing the research on Bhotia community is that they are challenging these uh, the, the, the concept of binary dress code uh, despite being a patriarchal society, a patriarchal community. The men wear ranga, a loose gown which reaches below the knee. Women wear maxi-like gown called chum chumala. I'll show you the picture of um, the men and women of the Bhotia community. See, this, these are the women. They are wearing black gowns and a white, kind, a white scarf kind of thing on their head. There is no veiling, as you can see. There is no veil. Similarly, I'll show you another picture of the men of the Bhotia community. Babita, you are left with five minutes now. Okay, I'll keep that in mind. Well, I, I was I'm looking for the picture. I can't find it right now. But see, these are these are men and women standing together. Both are wearing um, the white scarf and the the, uh, the white scarf on their head, and the women are wearing long gowns. The men too wear this long gown. There is no, kind of no difference in the length of their dress, um, and it there is not much difference in the height of clothes worn by uh, men and women both men and women wrap a thick rope like piece of white cloth around their waist area and it looks very empowering it is not exclusive to men wearing this white rope like cloth around the waist can be also interpreted as a symbolic of hard work hard working life and physical strength strength just a minute I was thinking if I could find that picture. Can't find that picture right now. But anyways, so they wear this white stole around their, uh, their waist. Uh, the women wear this white stole around their waist. And it looks very empowering. And it can be interpreted from, I personally um, analyze it, interpret it as a, a symbolic of hardworking life uh, and um, of strength. Okay, So it is not exclusive to men alone. The women also wear this white stole around their waist. Um, and it, it looks very empowering. It is not exclusive to men. This this also makes it interesting as it uh, reflects women's um, contributing equal labor to keep the socio-economic system of the tribe running. And this aspect is very important and empowering for women and needs to be recognized, especially in case of Himalayan women of uh, for uh, Himalayan women of Uttarakhand. Both men and women wear cap-like pieces of clothes on their head, but um, but um, on their head, but there's no concept of wheeling or hiding one's face for the Bhotia women. The men wrap a white scarf around their head, which they call chunkal or chungti, which covers their hair and women to wear a white cap like cloth around their uh, head called ch uh, chukla uh, without covering their face. 
the concept of wheeling is absent in many other Indian tribal communities. But the fact that they are highly influenced by Hindu religion, Hinduism, and consider themselves as a descendants of the Khasraj Booth, and they still do not incorporate the concept of wheeling as necessarily associated with modesty for women makes it an interesting phenomenon. For men and women cover their head with a white cloth as a symbol of respect for elders, but the concept of wheeling over the face is not there for women. Some scholarly articles justify the concept of wheeling for women in general by relating it with interiorized modesty of the self. In one of the scholarly, uh, scholarly articles by Anjum Alvi, she tries to establish the meaning of the term sharam in the Indian context so often invoked in relation to the wheel and is far richer than its usual English translation, shame. The term is often associated with modesty, morality, piety, and female sexuality and its control. She also emphasizes the use of word sharam to connote concealment at a value, uh, shyness, self-control, shy, uh, reservedness, etc., especially for women of the house. However, at this point, I would like to raise the question. Just two minutes, please. Uh, why is this interiorized modesty of the self concerns only women? The Bhutia, by making it norm for both women and men to wear a white cloth on their head as a symbolic of respect and modesty, actually makes it gender neutral, sartorial concept. Uh, a scholar, Pierre uh, Bourdieu, in his work, Outline of Theory of Practice, argues that the body is not an object but a subject of culture, and the Bhotias are indeed an example in setting the, the body as a subject of culture and challenging the biased gender norms to its traditional attire. The sartorial wheel is just one form of covering the body. Women are subjected to different kinds of wheeling in all societies. Applying makeup, for example, uh, over the face is one of those. Makeup for women is a form of wheeling uh, to cover the flaws, imperfections on their face and to look more feminine, more perfect. Men hardly ever feel this pressure of look, looking perfect, right? So this is another interesting fact, uh, fact that I came across while um, I was reading about the Bhutia community that traditionally there is no concept of makeup for women in this uh, uh, community, despite it being a patriarchal society. Um, while mainstream Indian society keeps colors like black, gray, and white for men, uh, this society, um, you know, uh, mostly the two, the two uh, prominent colors used by both men and women uh, in their dressing, uh, in their dresses is white and black. So I would like to conclude my paper now by arguing that the gender neutral and to some extent empowering traditional dress code of the Bhotia tribe is more significant, is more important than merely a part of their ethnic identity. It can be seen as a challenge to the binary dress code which exists in all patriarchal society to differentiate women from men and to construct femininity and masculinity through dress codes and by making the body of the women an object of culture. Despite it being a patriarchal society and despite being highly influenced by the neighboring Hindu community in Uttarakhand, they choose to opt for a dress code that does not strengthen patriarchal control over women. The concept of modesty through sartorial codes as a means is not restricted to women in this community. Uh, research on the Bhutia community so far has looked at the attire as merely uh, one of the elements of their indigenous community, uh, indigenous tribe, and such an important aspect of the dress code of the Bhutia community has unfortunately not been looked at, uh, has not been received, has not received enough scholarly attention uh, so far. Um, so, however, with the influence of modernity and westernization in Indian culture, the Bhotias are forgetting the empowerment that comes with their traditional attire and are imitating the binary in dress code to fit within the existing society. And as a researcher of, um, a researcher of folk culture and cultural studies, I see this as a matter of concern. Uh, and uh, that's all about my presentation. Thank you so much. I can't hear you, uh, Mercy. You are, uh, please unmute yourself. Thank you so much for your presentation and to remind us of the patriarchal conditioning and, of course, focusing on this particular community. So now let us take up a few questions that we have. Um, we have the first question, which is 
from the department. How do you define dress code in indigenous communities? Is it forced or mere acceptance to remain as a member of community and maintain a healthy community life? Uh, if you could please repeat it once again. Master. Sure. Yes. The question is, how do you define dress code in indigenous communities? Is it first or mere acceptance to remain as a member of community and maintain a healthy community life? Okay. Um. The question is by Professor P. C. Patnaik. Yeah, yeah. So, I the question. Uh, I don't think it is forced upon anyone and um, the indigenous community does not force uh, upon anyone, but it is in wearing the attire that we celebrate our identities, um, our roots, our belonging. Okay, so I do not personally feel that, um, I do not think that it is forced, the indigenous community forces anyone to uh, to stick to the traditional attire, to stick to the dress codes. Um, uh, of the of the community of the tribe, I think in wearing the dress code in um, in wearing the dress of the traditional attire of the community, uh, the people feel a sense of belonging, a sense of uh, community, and and it's very important um, in constructing us in constructing our identities in a an identity in in a world where we are all, you know, constantly trying to find an identity for ourselves. Okay. I hope Thank I you so sense. much for your insight. And there is another question, which is, you talked about the women dressing in a fashion devoid of glamorous trappings associated with gendered identity of women. Do you think this practice of dressing for comfort has something to do with the extreme terrain they inhabit and the nomadic life that they have as traveling traders? And this may not be a statement of gender equality. So this is a question by Anjala Upadhyay. Give me a moment. Of course, um, of course, I mean, the nomadic practice that they um, uh, observe is one of the important reasons, one of the uh, main reasons why the dress has to be comfortable and um, it has to be comfortable and uh, um, not very clumsy, not very uh, delicate. But uh, but I have also mentioned, I have also talked about the other factors, for example, look at the colors, for example, look at the fabric, for example. Uh, not only they are comfortable, but, um, uh, but it, of course, this is comfortable for women. The dress is comfortable for women. But along with that, there is no such other binaries being strictly followed as uh, as are followed in the mainstream society the binary of colors the binary of um, um, fabric for example both men and women wear, wear the same fabric um, the the women the dress is not very delicate uh, the colors are almost i mean the same for men and women the white and black are the dominant colors so yeah apart from the comfort i think I also see this as a very empowering statement and a, a contribution towards gender equality for these reasons. Thank you so much. So uh, there is another question, which might be the last question that we are taking for uh, your paper. This is from Dr. Pankaj Sharma. And uh, the question is this, has this neutral dressing empowered the Bhotia women as compared to other communities like status, respect, leadership aspects? If you could just elaborate the question once again. Has this neutral dressing empowered the Bhotia women as mm -hmm. compared to the other communities like status, respect, leadership, etc.? Empowered in the sense that um, I think it has empowered uh, not necessarily in terms of status and uh, all the other aspects that the um, uh, the, the audience asked, uh, but in other uh, aspects of life, right? They they feel more comfortable and they can perform their work with more efficiency 
a more um, um, you know more comfort so i think in that sense it must have empowered these women um uh, I, I'm not very sure if it has empowered in terms of status or uh, all these aspects, but definitely um, more comfortable um, and most gender neutrality in the sense allows them uh, to, you know, to feel more empowered, to have a, a greater sense of identity for themselves and to not feel inferior to men in the society, in the community. Yes, to feel themselves equal to the men in their community. So yes. thank you so much, Babita, for answering these questions and for this beautiful presentation. So maybe let us take the second paper. Um, can I uh, invite... Uh, uh, sorry, uh, Marcy, I think uh, there are two questions you allow. One is from Garima and she has joined from Australia. Okay, sir. Another is Akash, our student. Just allow. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. So there is a comment uh, made by Akash. I'm glad to attend this presentation. It's quite interesting to know from the presentation that a community is already debunking the myth of gender binary when major national and international fashion brands are trying to incorporate gender neutral dressing in their fashion creativity in quite recent years only. Yes. So very insightful, uh, yes. And there is uh, another it has become a trend. Uh, give me a moment if I can, yes. you know, just yes. comment on this comment. It has, uh, you know, nowadays, uh, uh, it has, I mean, people are doing this. People are trying to change this gender bi binary, uh, not only by choosing gender neutral colors and gender neutral um, fashion, but also by cross dressing and uh, um, you know breaking these norms all the time the fashion blogger for example the siddharth malhotra is uh, you know nowadays followed for uh, wearing women's sari sari along with the kurta and um, all these stuff so yes recently i mean it's very interesting for me to observe that something that has happened very recently something that has come in the limelight very recent was practiced since um, the origin of this uh, tribal community. And it's very interesting to know. So there is another comment which I too endorse uh, that is made by Garima, which is this, makeup is not merely a form of self-correction, but a form of self-expression and autonomy. Thus, I would like to challenge your idea, India, idea, India that not using, um, idea that not using makeup is empowering and freedom for both dear women. Okay, so no, nowhere did I say that it is empowering. Nowhere did I say that makeup is uh, uh, empowered, uh, not uh, not having um, not having the concept of makeup for women is empowers them. Or I what I what I was trying to the point that I was trying to make in my presentation is that that maybe it's not empowering, but. Um, but the, the whole idea of makeup is also, uh, I see makeup also as a wheel, as a concealment, you know? So there we have various uh, makeup products, the concealer, for example, the foundation and all that. Maybe it's empowering for some women, but some women do it out of a mere necessity to look perfect. And I, I, I feel perfection is just a myth. Yeah. Right. So, it may be empowering. It may not be empowering. That's uh, that's a debatable question. Part of a self-expression. Right. Yes. Yeah. So this is it for this paper. Next, I would like to invite Dr. Rashmita Tripathi and Dr. Preeti Nanda Roy for presenting their paper, Marriage System of Gond Tribe of Western Odisha, an overview. May I invite Dr. Rashmita Tripathi and Dr. Preeti Nandaroy? Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Respected Professor Prakash Patnaik, sir, uh, moderator and learned participants, we are extremely happy that we got the opportunity to present our research paper on marriage system of Gun Tribe of Western Odisha and Oriyu. This research paper is a collaborative effort of me and Dr. Preeti Nandarai, Assistant Professor of Kiss Dimtu University. In our paper, a detailed discussion is made on the marriage system of Gun Tribe of Western Odisha. 
Now I request Dr. Pichinanda Rai to present the paper. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, ma'am, uh, esteemed, uh, learned uh, participants. Uh, uh, I, ju I just need uh, a minute to share my PPT, ma'am. Sure, sure. You have 20 minutes. So just keep in mind the time limit. Yeah, it is visible. Yes, it is visible. Thank you. Uh, very good afternoon, uh, everyone. I am Dr. Prithitina Roy. And uh, I am to present uh, the marriage system of Gone Tribe of Odisha, an overview. So, before I uh, go detail into the system of Gone Tribe, uh, I would like to introduce the institution of marriage. It is an age old institution with the mechanism for forming social groups. And certain motives behind this institution. First is gratification of sexual desires. Second is caring for her rearing of children. It also helps in transmission of culture and tradition from one generation to the other. And the, this, these are some of the objectives which is very uh, common and uh, found in every society all over the world. And uh, marriage is, a, is an institution that brings two families together, two societies together, but from bringing two individuals together. The objective of our highlight system of marriage of the Gone tribe of Western Odisha. Uh, we also would like to discuss the types of marriage of the Gone tribe and uh, to study the beliefs and practices of different types of born marriage, to highlight their indigenous culture and popular beliefs, to discuss the role of their family, society, and associations in framing and regulating the rules and policies of their marriage. The uh, data that we have collected uh, is through interviews and group discussions. Uh, and uh, we have also uh, followed some of the studies and reviews of related uh, literature. The sample size of our uh, data collection is 200 approximately. The Gon tribe of Odisha. Uh, Gon is a tribe which is mostly concentrated in the districts of uh, districts, uh, western districts of Odisha like Nabrangpur, Sundargarh, Sambalpur, Balangir, and in some parts of Kalahandi district. They build uh, their habitat near hills and they are numerically a dominant tribal group in our state. Uh, history records them as a warrior community and they are termed as Khetriyas. They are very closely re uh, related to uh, the Dravidians and in Odisha they speak uh, their dialect is assimilated with our state language Odia and they speak Odia language. Marriage rules which are followed by these tribe, the tribe, uh, this Gone tribe has exogamous totemic clan divisions and uh, the clan and subclan exo exogamy is the basic rule of their marriage. The, their principle of marriage extends to clan cluster, cluster exogamy they have cross cousin marriage and marriage by negotiation, which is very commonly found. Marriage by service is also socially permitted and marriages are preferred within close relations according to Hindu rights and customs. They have different kinds of different types of marriages. Uh, first, we'll discuss the arranged uh, marriage. Uh, the first step is the selection of mate. The boys' family, they get the proposal from the girls' family. And after getting the proposal, the, uh, the father of the uh, boy, and along with uh, some of his uh, relatives, mostly the maternal uncles, they visit the girls' house. And after discussion, if they agree to go ahead with the proposal, 
then the horoscope of the boy and the girl is matched it is matched by the priest and if the horoscope matches then they decided they decide to uh, finalize the marriage uh, process and uh, they plan to finalize some date the first are up the boy's father has to go to the girl's house to finalize a date of engagement they discuss about their ancestral lineage before finalizing a date then after a few days the girl's parent parents and her relatives will visit the boy's house to uh, to check the social status and the economical condition of the boy's uh, family and uh, while visiting they are treated with sumptuous food and drink by the boy's family and before leaving before leaving the girl, uh, boy's house the family of the girl mostly the uh, the brothers of the girl, of the uh, bride to be they wash the feet of the would be son in law and they gift him with uh, either a gold ring or a watch the second step on the finalized date the boy's father along with his relatives go to the girl's house they exchange rice pearls uh, pulses vegetables sweets local wine dresses sarees etc and they arrange a feast it's on that uh, on that day that they finalize the marriage date as per the convenience of both the families uh, that is that is the way their engagement is done then the uh, different rituals that is that are followed the, for their marriage the first is pani chadha that is called pani chadha in their uh, in their language it is a ritual uh, which starts before uh, four, uh, prior to uh, four five days prior to the date of marriage the ladies and the girls of the family they apply a paste of turmeric and uh, which is uh, mixed with uh, powdered rice and oil on the body of the bridegroom and that leftover uh, turmeric paste is sent to the girl's house and the same ritual is followed in the girl's house this system is called pani chadha then comes the day of the marriage the first ritual that is followed on the day of marriage is sara madu they plant uh, a sal tree or, and a mahul tree these two two trees are considered auspicious by the gon people they plant these two trees on the marriage pendal and uh, this process is called saramoda if they believe that if they won't plant these trees on the or this if this process is not followed then the soul of the bridegroom will not get salvation this also signifies the importance of uh, trees in their life not only uh, during uh, the all through their life the importance of uh, trees and nature uh, next is the next uh, ritual that is followed uh, that is called pani china and samudhi bhet the bridegroom's father reaches the bride's place along with his friends and relatives and uh, the when the bride uh, bridegroom's father comes this intimation is sent to the girl's family and the girl's parents also they come out of their house and the place in their village inside their village the place where they meet with each other the the ritual starts at that spot only and uh, they uh, exchange uh, different uh, 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 rice vegetables they, these things are exchanged and they perform a puja and this uh, and they hug each other the boy's father and the girl's father they hug each other after the performance of the ritual this process is called samudhi bhet next is barakhi after the samudhi bhet everyone proceeds to the bride's place this is like a procession of uh, like barat the bride's father offers homemade indigenous cake uh, which is which in uh, their language is called pitha in, in odia it is also called pitha and along with other goodies and uh, this process is called barakhi next is uh, pindhani pindhani is uh, it is it is a it is a, a ritual in which the uh, groom's father presents uh, cake puffed rice clothes jewelries to the bride and the bride 
six blessing from every uh, everyone present uh, on that uh, on that day and she touches their feet and six blessing uh, this process is called pindhani and while uh, taking leave the groom's father gives some money to the bride which symbolically implies the bride has been bought next is kankar mula the bride and groom they tie a root on their arms after tying the same around the sal and the mahul tree which was planted on the marriage bundle this is also considered very auspicious and the last uh, process of the marriage is hasta bandhan after tying the root to the tree the bride is brought to the bundle the marriage rituals starts after that amidst the recitation of mantras by the priest who is known as who is called laganya the priest put uh, the palm of the bride over that of the groom's palm and they untie a sacred thread around their palm the thread is untied by the bride's brother and in return he receives some money from the groom this is called hasta bandhan father charan is uh, a ritual which takes place on uh, the day after the marriage this ritual uh, signifies the end of all the uh, uh, hustle bustle of marriage on this day everything is put back in its place uh, the guest who have come to attend the marriage for uh, few days uh, last few days they also uh, they also uh, can leave uh, leave that day so that day a feast is arranged and uh, after having a sumptuous uh, feast they can they go back to their own places and their normal life starts there is an, the last ritual of their marriage is on the 8th day of uh, the marriage that is called atha mangla atha mangla is the eight, it is observed on the 8th day of the marriage on this day the bride cooks uh, for the first time in her in-laws house and she offer the deities uh, the cooked food as prasad and after that the other uh, people who were present in the house they can have that uh, uh, cooked uh, food and this is the day when the uh, bride and the groom they start their conjugal life so this is all about their uh, marriage arranged marriage they have different types of marriage the uh, first which were, which was discussed uh, was arranged marriage and second is uh, ghar jamai that is in hindi also it is called ghar jamai in this marriage the groom doesn't go back with his bride to his own house uh, rather he stays with the bride's family forever and this kind of marriage is preferred by uh, the bride's uh, parents who do not have any son next is another uh, form of marriage that is called gicha biva biva in this uh, this this uh, uh, this is uh, a kind of marriage by force when a gone boy falls in love with a girl but the families do not agree for the marriage the boy forcefully abducts the girl and gets married after a few days they are brought back to the village and uh, their uh, uh, their their uh, this case is discussed among the tribal leaders uh, their community leaders if during that discussion if the girl denies to stay with the boy she is uh, sent back to her home and the boy's family will be uh, is dr tripathi you have muted the video audio Dr. Rashmita Tripathi, are you there? Please unmute your audio. Dr. Rashmita Tripathi, are you there? Have we lost the connection? Yeah, ma'am. Uh, am I audible now? Yes, yes, Hello. yes. Yes, okay, you are left for five more minutes now. 
Okay, ma'am, I'll I'll complete within that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so Udulia Biha, uh, it is very similar to love marriage uh, when the boy and the girl loves uh, love each other, but they are opposed by their families. Uh, so they uh, flee from their village and uh, stay some uh, stay at some uh, far away place for some days, and after that they come back. And if and after coming back, their uh, families have to accept. they must husband and wife and uh, the last one is paisa mudi uh, paisa mudi biva in this uh, marriage uh, if a girl gets attracted by a boy she goes to stay in the boy's house and if the boy denies to marry the girl she is sent back to her home if he agrees to get uh, agrees to the marriage then their marriage is arranged so this is all about uh, gone the marriage the findings of our study uh, are uh, like they have undergone uh, perceptible changes due to influence of education development intervention uh, developmental interventions hinduization and modernization the gone marriage rituals are very similar to some other tribes like kisan munda santal kharia or kolho and ho uh, previously they used uh, palki or uh, bullock cart to carry the bride group bride and groom but now they are using bicycle rickshaw or uh, car uh, for that purpose and previously they used to dance on their indigenous musical instruments but now they are dancing uh, to the tune of dj and loud speakers the educated gon people have adopted new methods of marriage system which has crossed the blind uh, faiths and rituals of the gon and the rituals of the gon tribe are still on practice but some of them are removed from the list gradually the use of rice beer is av avoided by young mas and in the place of rice beer the modern educated gon are using foreign liquor but apart from all this some of the gon people are still strictly observing their own cultural practices so this is all about our presentation Uh, thank you very much thank you for giving us this opportunity uh, special thanks to professor pc patnaik sir thank you thank you so much dr rashmita tripathi and dr preeti nanda roy for a wonderful portrayal of vivid uh, you know the structures of marriage in gon tribe so uh, we have a first question by professor pc patnaik gons use a language gondi which is a di dialectical variation of odia and use highly sanskritized terminologies related to wedding as an outsider where do you trace the ethnic culture yes ma'am uh, actually uh, gond uh, tribe they had uh, uh, they have their own indigenous language but uh, with the advent of uh, industrialization and modernization that uh, their own uh, dialect has been uh, it is diluted and uh, somehow most of the gonds they are now uh, speaking in odia language and they are uh, no more they do not have uh, their own language anymore or the new generation of gond uh, tribe uh, people they are not using any other language than odia mostly thank you thank you so much um i have a question uh, it's it is from my own curiosity that uh, like you said um, because of urbanization and modernization everything is changed and gone tribe is also uh, changing so do you think this change that modernization has brought will uh, diminish the importance of uh, gondi language or the culture definitely ma'am definitely but uh, uh, that uh... you are very right uh, in apprehending that uh, urbanization and industrialization is de definitely diminishing their own ethnic uh, culture and tradition their language and uh, literature uh, it it is it uh, the onus is on the uh, new generation of gond uh, uh, people uh, the uh, educated gond mass and most of the gond uh, people they uh, they have in this generation i'll say that they are the first generation learners and it the onus is on them 
how to protect their own culture, right. how to keep their culture uh, uh, unadulterated uh, from the impact of uh, urbanization and westernization. It is upon them. And ma'am, uh, I would like to mention here that we, uh, I, uh, myself and Dr. Rasmita Tripathi, ma'am, we are working in a, in a university which is uh, KISS Kalinga Institute of Social Science, which is exclusively for tribal students. And uh, we provide education to students from KG and PG. Uh, at present, we have 30,000 uh, tribal students reading in our uh, institution. Wonderful. In 2007, we got the status of university, and here we try to uh, impart knowledge, advanced uh, knowledge, scientific knowledge, and at the same time, we take all the uh, measures to help them, to teach them how to protect their own culture and uh, how to protect their own ethnic ethnicity. Right. Very thoughtful endeavor, I would say. Thank you. Okay, we have another question by... Uh, Bitali Burman, ma'am. Rashmita, ma'am, I would like to know the role of marriage songs in Gon tribes' marriage. Uh, Are there uh, any rituals uh, that. Uh, uh, yes, we sir? can request her to stop sharing so that uh, there will be full screen. Yes, sir. Yes, okay. sir. Can I request you to please stop sharing the presentation, presenting screen, and so that please we can. Yes. There is problem continue like that then. Okay. okay. So, there is another question, um, Dr. Rashmita Tripathi. It's for you. Um, from Mitali Burman, ma'am. I would like to know the role of marriage songs in Gone Tribes marriage. Are there any rituals where songs are essential parts of them? Yes, ma'am. Ma uh, um, first, I would like to uh, clarify that I'm Dr. Priti Nanda Roy, uh, co-presenter. Okay, 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 okay. Okay, uh, and uh, the question uh, which was put, uh, the role of mar uh, songs in Gone Marriage. Ma'am, um, songs have uh, formed a very integral part of a, a tribal life and culture. And they have specific songs. And uh, the uh, songs which, uh, which used to be played, uh, sung during the marriages are no... Uh, no more used uh, in the present context because uh, the new generation have started uh, uh, they have started uh, following the Bollywood and the Hollywood uh, songs and their own indigenous songs are mostly forgotten and they do not have uh, their own uh, scripts and for which uh, uh, they have not documented uh, those things so gradually they are forgetting and uh, gradually the Western culture is has a great impact on their own songs. So in marriages, they are no longer using their own songs. Rather, they are using the Odia songs or the Hindi songs. Yes, ma'am. Okay, okay. So thank you so much. We do not have any more questions. So let us go to the third paper for the session. So may I invite... Thank you, ma'am. Thank, thank you so much for presenting a beautiful paper. Uh, Dr. Preeti Nanda Roy and Dr. Rashmita Tripathi. So we have our third paper for the session, which is titled as Access Mundi in the Creation Myths of Meghalaya by Dr. Anju Majaz. May I request Dr. Anju Majaz for the presentation? Can we have Just the third paper? Check, uh, if she is there, if she is available. Yes, I am doing that. Uh, Dr. Benkert, please uh, help in finding. Is there any name? Anjum. She did not join, but I think so. She did not. So let us move to the next paper instead of wasting. Yes. Okay, sir. In the case. If she joins, we will ask later, but, we'll ask later if she joins, we will give her. Very good. Very good. Okay. Okay. So in that case, let us move on to the uh, last paper, 
for the session, which is titled as Law of Inheritance Among the Bodo Women in India, which will be presented by Junmani Basumathri. So may I request uh, Junmani Basumathri to present the paper? Are you there? Unfortunately, I cannot find the names here. Both the paper presenters are not present here, I guess. Yeah. In that case, I think better we should stop here instead of waiting for them. And uh, we have not received any communication from them. Yes. Sir. And the reason of selecting them in this session, particularly this part of the webinar is, they had sent the full paper, full length paper. So I thought perhaps those who are ready with their paper, they will be certainly available. So we don't mind, uh, our uh, participants will give, because we'll get sufficient time to take rest and uh, we'll be ready for tomorrow, that is Sunday morning, 10 o'clock. But of course, the announcement are, will come from the present sessions moderator, Mercy Jiljil. So over to you, Mercy. It is your decision. Um, as we do not have any participants for the paper presentation, I think we will have to uh, stop the session. Um, I would like to ask comments from the participants regarding any of the paper. Anyone would like to share any anything you can. So there is a comment by uh, Dr. Pankaj Sharma asking you to comment on the papers presented so that we get more insight on uh, uh, me. Uh, that will be again uh, bias and uh, it will not be of good uh, test, uh, Dr. Sharma. I honor your request, but I will not comment on any particular paper because I have tried to encourage the participants by putting some queries from my side in the beginning. Normally what happens in the sessions like this, we always wait, that is the Indian mind and behavior that has become a part of culture, who passed? That's the question. And that is the reason I used to put some question, not to trouble any participants, but it is one and a half day, yesterday and today, Things have gone very well. I think Dr. Sarma, Pankaj Sarma, who are present throughout, you must have seen, and I'm extremely happy. And to some participants who are joining for the first time, Dr. Rashmita Tripathi, Dr. Pitananda Rai, they will also, and others, those who are joining with us for the first time, those who are not there in the previous webinar, they will realize how strict we are in maintaining time. And uh, the model is to allow 30 minutes to each paper presenters. Because I have attended many seminars where they are only given five minutes, 10 minutes, and then uh, disappear. This is one, th one way. And when we talk about the conferences, you will find there are five present paper presenters, one chairperson, and total number of participants will be those six. So our situation is not like that. We are still 20, 42. Yes. We are watching and simultaneously they are in the Facebook. Others must be watching. So it so is going on very well. We yeah. have a question from uh, Gari Mart. It's not a question, maybe a statement to discuss. Also a question. Can we discuss the appropriation of tribal culture in modern India, Indian culture and abroad? For instance, we note uh, that the use of uh, ikat in household items uh, would, without understanding its origins and significance by consumers internationally. And uh, also, 
Dr. Pankaj Sharma also would like to have a um, general discussion from you. So these are the statements for discussion, sir. Okay, let us listen from them. What is their yes, idea? Sir. Yeah, and I would request uh, Dr. Venkat to make them co-host. Let us listen from them what exactly they want yes, instead of uh, writing on the chat box. Right. Sir, they can unmute, sir, if there is a need, sir. Okay, Very Dr. Pamish Sarma, you can uh, unmute, introduce yourself, and uh, let us have a discussion. And uh, happy to see you, Very much from uh, such a distant uh, you know, place, and you are making it. So we all uh, also, we are also interested to listen to your experience there, linked with the indigenous communities. Yes, Dr. Sarma. We see you. If you have anything to add, any suggestion to give, uh, you are free to do that. Yeah, you can unmute yourself and participate in the discussion. Hi, uh, I guess uh, Dr. Sharma would like to go first. You have joined, you, you, you start speaking. That's not a problem. But why I say this is because I see a lot of appropriation or use of uh, Indian tribal culture and um, a lot of our cultural artifacts without understanding, you know, which state do they come from? What is their significance? And I saw this uh, from a personal anecdote, like a personal story I would like to share. This happened at my husband's, uh, like my in-law's house. And they had this ikat curtains. And I got very excited when I saw it. I said, you know, I know this pattern, it's called ikat. And, I, uh, and nobody knew what it was. So they had bought it from the store. But they did not know. And I remember, um, uh, like my husband's auntie, they're Australian. So they said, yeah, it's Ikut. And I said, no, it's Ikut. And it's actually like, you know, it's uh, it's from the tribal region of Odisha. And uh, it is their cultural product. So I just wanted to have like, you know, from the scholars here, particularly Dr. Patnayak, to know more about like, you know, what um, uh, about significance of our uh, Indian tribal cultures and their artifacts and how we can stop this kind of appropriation uh, which is like you know because these patterns are just adopt, uh, adapted or like they are sold um, to the consumers worldwide they are, they are made profit of but the people whose designs they are which is the collective tribal uh, people they are not benefited by this yeah what i could understand garima and thank you. This is a very uh, important issue in the present situation that must have, uh, you know, many upset things are happening. But my uh, journey is different. I propose a different journey. Look at the artifact and try to enter to the court. It is not that you go to the community and identify the artifact. Look at the what you did in the stadium. And looking at that product, we are going to the community and that product speaks. Take the example of any household, you will find lots of different varieties of uh, you know, bamboo products. Then immediately our mind goes that this is from that state. We see Muga silk, we immediately conclude that must be an Assamese or there is an Assam connection. We see Sambalpuri Sari, you, know, you are fascinated Sambalpuri Sari and uh, uh, that is very popular. Then immediately mind goes that yes, this is from Orissa. Then if we are very much inclined towards that, then we start collecting information. You know, the last uh, month I had visited UPSC. And that is a secret uh, department. And in all the halls, all the halls, beautiful paintings are there. And it has so happened that all the paintings, 
when I looked, I said they are from Odisha, not because that I'm from Odisha and I have a kind of possessive machine. They are from Odisha, from a particular village called Raghurajpur, that is on the way from Puri, from Bhuvaneshwar to Puri. And the entire village, nowhere else, entire village is involved in making those paintings that are called Patachitra. So they speak, they speak any artifact you take, you will find its origin, information about the origin, how they are made, and what is speciality about that, the cloth, how they use uh, local materials, ingredients to make paste, local colors collected from soil, leaves, and you know other indigenous items, and they put it like that. And of course, the whole family is involved in just making one piece, one art piece. And that happens to all the things. And go to Kamla Nagar, Delhi, near to Delhi University Market. There was a time I remember, perhaps you were also putting that time, a t-shirt. And there will be a chain of people who will know that there is a boy and girl, maybe hundreds. And it goes like a rotation. And that immediately reminds us either worldly painting of Gujarat and Maharashtra or Saura painting of Orissa. So these are uh, the things and there will be commercialization. There is no doubt with it. Even after that, we can notice, we can collect information about the core components of that product. So that is how you have gotten and uh, suppose the boomerang kind of instrument as a showpiece you are given. So that reminds me of Australia, not anywhere, uh, from anywhere, anybody or from any other place. Similarly, if I hear a folk tales where there is a kangaroo is a character, immediately I will say it is Australia. So we are not talking about the human. You are not talking about the community. We are not talking about the tribal. We are talking about the tribal life. And yesterday I had said in the concept paper that this doesn't mean the life of the tribals. This is the life that involves everything. So we will have discussion in the future. Otherwise, this will be another paper from my side. And uh, Dr. Sarma, you wanted to ask something, please. Because you are our regular participant, so we honor your presence. Thank you so much, Patnaik, sir, for your insight. Um, we now request Dr. Pankaj Sharma for your insights or discussion points. Sir, you were not audible. Is Dr. Sharma audible for all of you? Dr. Pankaj Sharma, can we request you to unmute your audio? Okay. We can't. Okay, yes. Okay, I think we should close then. Huh? Okay, sir. We okay. should write up. Yeah. So, sir, there is a voice issue. So, can we close the session now? Yes, you please go. Yeah. Please go. Ahead. So thank you so much, all of you, for attending this session. It was a very informative session, and we've got several insights from Professor PC Patnaik and the participants present here. A lot of questions were answered, a lot of queries and curiosities were answered. Thank you so much, all of you. And uh, let us meet tomorrow for the third day of the and the final day of the 
uh, webinar, national webinar. Thank that you is the much. last day of the first part of the seminar. Yes. Because there last are others last waiting last for the second part. Right, right. This is the part, first, part one of the seminar. I'm very glad to inform you all that we have this in uh, second part, maybe also in third. We never know. Yeah. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, all of you.